Good afternoon. My name is Sunil Kumar, and I have the privilege to serve as the provost of Johns Hopkins University. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this uh, special event where we formally introduce Dr. Jeffrey Kahn as the second Andreas C. Dracopoulos director of the Berman Institute of Bioethics. And like most things in Hopkins, we only decide to announce this after we've had a chance to test the thing out. <laughs> so I think it's been nine months, and uh, we now feel reasonably confident that we can move forward. So uh, I'd like to start by uh, stating for the record that if you had come for the Friday evening performance, you would have gotten the main uh, star, Ron Daniels. The, unfortunately, Monday night gets the understudy. So, <laughs> and uh, and uh, on his behalf, I'd like to apologize and let you know that uh, it may be a long time before we have another director for bioethics, so you'll have to look for another event to go to and listen to Ron. <laughs> Being a bureaucrat, uh, I decided that I'll start my remarks by talking about the org chart. <laughs> I, I'm serious. I am not. Uh... The uh, Berman Institute for Bioethics is called an academic and cultural center. This is a catch-all category for half a dozen institutes that report into the provost. And that should immediately cause concern among you all, because as you know, at Hopkins, almost everything is at the school level. They are within a school. And this is one of those institutes that's not within a school, nor should it be. And that's not just a bureaucrat wanting to acquire turfs talking. It's rather uh, the unique mission of bioethics and the unique structure of the institute that's been set up has uh, led itself to being kind of the exemplar, if you will, of what one university means at Hopkins and how such even a relatively small institute can have a cross-university impact. More importantly, um, and by the way, if you think I'm praising Jeff, I'm not. I'll get there. <laughs> uh, more importantly, it's not just stayed within the academy, but it has engaged with the world at large. Uh, it does education. It wants to do more education. It wants to do more convening as a way of engaging with the world on a topic whose importance I don't need to stress. So who I'm really praising here is, of course, Ruth Fed. <laughs> uh, don't screw it up, Jeff. <laughs> Ruth's done a fantastic job, as you know, in an entirely entrepreneurial way, building a national board, building a faculty, and also acquiring a building, which in Hopkins is a non-trivial achievement, usually harder than the other two, <laughs> and, and, has, uh, and it has resulted in something that we are very, very proud of. And so thank you, Ruth, and for all that you've done. <laughs> the American private university is an amazing entity. Uh, it relies on individuals who have no contractual obligation to the university to not just further its mission, but to essentially enable its operations. We could not operate without both the moral, but more importantly, philanthropic support of a lot of our alumni and friends, and the Berman Institute is also a case in point. And to that end, I would like to acknowledge um, Andreas Dracopoulos and the Niarcos Foundation, both of whom have been extraordinary supporters of the university at large. And with fully understanding the scope of the university, they have not only, for example, supported, and Andreas personally has supported the Berman Institute, but the foundation has also supported our uh, 
uh, media center where the film festival is being held. And uh, you should go take a look if uh, after this and uh, the entertainment's better. And, uh, and uh, so I would like to personally and on behalf of Ron Daniels express my gratitude to Andrea Estrakopoulos. Thank you. And finally, we have had uh, an advisory board um, where, as you know, university boards, the cash flow is in one direction only. And so this is an uncompensated board where people give their time and talent. And I'd like to thank Alex Le Levy for being such a good um, uh, director of the board, a chairman of the board, and, uh, and uh, who is also a, an emeritus trustee of the university. Thank you, Alex, and I'm delighted to yield the floor to you. Thank you. Sunil, you're a tough act to follow. What a glorious day and what a wondrous event. The installation of the second Dracopolis director of the Johns Hopkins University Berman Institute of Bioethics. In today's polarized, blue-red, divisive dialogue of the deaf, where it seems no order of business can be achieved without a hue and a cry from some set of stakeholders whose ox is being gored, today's events marks a seamless transition from our first to our second Dracopolis director. As Andreas might shout, bravo. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize one who is like a father figure to me, Bud Meyerhoff the Berman Institute's second board chair who served for years until I was tapped to step into his rather large pair of shoes. His contribution to Johns Hopkins and the Berman Institute are legendary and, and cannot be overstated. The national conversation has regressed from Stephen Colbert's truthiness to Kellyanne Conway's alternative facts and even further to what some are calling a post-truth world. In such an environment, it becomes hard to know who and what to trust. Even words are losing their meanings. So perhaps what I'm about to say reflects poorly on my education, but I've been struggling with the definition of the word installation. I can't, I can't offer a replacement, but my first associations are to computer software and apps. And those who know me would not accuse me of being on the cutting edge of the computer revolution. Webster's, what was once a well-honored authority but was challenged by the American Heritage Dictionary, defines installation as the noun form of installari, i.e. to put in place or a seat. The first definition refers to people placed in an office or rank with formality or ceremony. So here we are. So much for my associations. But the second definition is to fix in position as a mechanical apparatus, such as a heating apparatus. Now, Jeff is anything but mechanical, and I'm sure that there are times when he can heat up and get hot under the collar. But I've never had the pleasure of witnessing such. I find him to be so even-tempered and reasonable that he is the ideal person to become our next director. So I am left to wonder, now that he is finally installed, what was he before? <laughs> How to think of him over the last 10 months? Was he uninstalled or just stalled? <laughs> the, word, the word stall is defined as a stand or place where an animal is kept or fed. <laughs> it just doesn't seem to apply. Perhaps it's a reference to Jeff's role at the Institute of Medicine. He chaired a groundbreaking report on the use of chimpanzees in biomedical research and concluded that they should be let out of their stalls and not under most circumstances be used as experimental subjects. Over the last 10, 10 months, while his status as stalled or uninstalled may have applied, he has functioned remarkably well under the circumstances. He's administered the Institute with a clear direction, taking on personnel change challenges and outlining his vision of the next 20 years at Berman. To end my reverie on words and their definitions, I eagerly await the changes that Jeff, now formally installed, will herald for Berman's future. I feel as if I've been involved in the process from beginning to end. So from my perspective as the chair of the advisory board, all the pieces fit so nicely together. 
In contrast to the transition in Washington from the wise, nuanced, subtle, and cool Obama administration to our current tweeter in chief, the transition from Ruth to Jeff was like the passing of the baton on the U.S. Olympic relay team, done flawlessly and with such grace. Andreas, note the Greek reference. <laughs> Just to be clear, I claim that I am bias-free and am presenting an objective account of the events leading up to this moment. The fact that Jeff returned to Hopkins as the inaugural Levy professor has not, not in any way affected my attitude. The fact that I was so proud to have him representing our family's heritage and especially the memory of my beloved parents has not influenced me in the least for I am fair-minded and free of bias. If anyone here doubts my capacity for fair and objective judgment, just consult my wife, <laughs> who in our 40 years of, 47 years of marriage has never contradicted me. <laughs> All right. Of course, be sure to query her when she is in a good mood, and I have recently told her how much I love her with promises to travel to Atlantic City or Cuba. <laughs> Otherwise, just trust me. I know what I'm saying. Unlike everyone else, I do not suffer from biases. Seriously, though, I was part of the grueling, and I, did, and I do mean grueling, selection process. Jeff clearly distinguished himself from the other most impressive candidates. His being the inside candidate may have acted against him in the sense that all on the selection committee were sworn to fight against any tendency towards uncut towards conscious or unconscious bias, and bend over backwards to be fair to every candidate. All were put through a series of interviews, and Jeff probably more than anyone had to shine. If anything, he may have been made to endure a more thorough and detailed inspection and evaluation just to counteract the possibility of the process being misconstrued. Very early in the process, Phil Tang met with our advisory board to get their sense of Jeff's standing. He was nearly threatened with a revolt. If Jeff was not to be the chosen one, I had never seen the board so energized and strong in their regard for anyone. Both Phil and I knew that this had to be a fair and above board selection process, as it's just too easy to do a pro forma search when the inside candidate is so highly regarded and loved. He is here today because he was by all definition the most qualified candidate. He carried himself with poise, confidence, charm, intelligence, and generosity. Orly, if you've not seen these traits at home, come talk to me, because I can coach you. <laughs> they are there, but just may not always be most manifest. He just had to be in the running for something. It was most interesting to hear many of the other candidates for the directorship refer to the house that Ruth built, the team that she had assembled as a first-rate bioethics faculty, including mention of Jeff as an outstanding member of the profession and a formidable pre presence against whom to compete. Many s seemed awed and a bit at a loss as to how they might build on Berman's stellar reputation. Jeff and I have been working together as uninstalled director and board chair over the last 10 months, and I only hope it was as good for you as it's been for me. <laughs> there was some adjustment, as he is not Ruth, but the transition has been easy, and we've developed a most satisfying partnership. I do worry that, that, like Ruth, he takes on far more than any, any single person can manage. But he is always a good cheer, well-focused, and available as we review the challenges facing Berman from both the inside and the outer world. Maybe I just worry too much as he, was ha as he has handled such challenges with aplomb. When I learned that he followed the renowned bioethicist Arthur Kaplan at Minnesota as director of their program, and then wants to duplicate the feat by following in the footsteps of the renowned bioethicist Ruth Faden, I wondered whether there was a pattern here. What to make of this phenomenon? <coughs> Not wanting to pathologize the new Levy professor, I worried that this new addition to the faculty suffered from a masochistic compulsion to hide in the shadows of prior leaders. <laughs> who, in, who in their right mind would take on such hard to succeed situations? But as I have gotten to know Jeff reasonably well, I am glad to report that my fears were completely unjustified. My preliminary diagnosis was wrong. This is not the case. He just has broad shoulders, is a natural born leader, is great at stepping up and doing ever, whatever it takes to make things work, and seems completely unaffected by those who preceded him. 
He's respectful of their accomplishments, but goes forward unfazed and takes to command laying out his vision for the future. My hat's off to you, sir. Now I have the duty and pleasure of introducing my dear friend and fellow board member, Andreas Dracopoulos. One of the great benefits of volunteering for nonprofit board service is the new relationships that are possible. It was more than a decade ago that Andreas and I shared the tra train back to New York, and from that moment on, our friendship has only grown and deepened. This has been facilitated by fine wine and fine dining. I realize I'm about to embarrass him and make him uncomfortable, but I know our friendship can tolerate this betrayal. He always wants me to focus on the Institute and not on him, but I only, I only wish I could say honestly, I'm sorry, but that's not the case as Andreas deserves this recognition. He's a wonderful person who exhibits fascinating balances of competing traits. He combines hard-headed realism with soft-hearted sentimentalism, a strong-willed individualism with a committed communitarianism, a passionate aestheticism with a clear-eyed rationality, an interpersonal insightfulness and sensitivity with present, prescient objectivity and a capacity to make tough executive decisions. And finally, there is his laughter, a blend of youthful joyous exuberance and existential absurdist irony. In short, he is a complex, multifaceted, and fascinating individual. I know Andre Andreas can't handle all this praise, but it is deserved. I also know we shall have words over this, but it, can, it can't be any worse than our disputation over the relative merits of Bordeaux or Burgundy wine. In the great scholastic tradition, this is a controversy without end. I will present him with my evidence, and he will present me with his. Who is to make the final judgment? It will have to rest in your minds to decide which of us prefers the Bordeaux to the Burgundy. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to present my dear friend and Bordeaux lover, Andreas Dracopoulos. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here today to celebrate with you Jeff's installation. We all knew and know that it would be tremendously difficult to fill in the shoes of Dr. Ruth Faden, the one and only Ruth Faden. Ruth has been the driving force, the soul of the Berman Institute since its birth and continues to be an integral member of the Berman family. At the same time, and a big part of Ruth's success all these years is the A-team that Ruth assembled to work with her all these years. Nancy, Jeremy, Jeff, Gail, Cinda, and others have worked so hard and continue to do so, sharing a devotion and a common vision for the importance of bioethics at large. It is a passion of theirs, and, and the way they all work together has paid back huge dividends for the success of the Berman Institute and for that of Hopkins itself. Bioethics will continue to play a very important role in our, in, in our society going forward, and Hopkins is very lucky to have the Berman Institute, and most importantly, the team of devoted people who work in it. It's a win-win situation, and although no one should rest on, on past success, I think occasions like, like today should be truly celebrated on all fronts. As I said um, above, it is very difficult to fill in the shoes of Ruth, but I have this feeling, and it is a very strong feeling, that in a very long time from today, when the time comes for the next director to come in, he or she will have an equally tough time to fill in the shoes of Jeff Kahn. Hard work, teamwork, intellectual capacity, common sense, strong ethics, passion, devotion, and love for what you do can only mean one thing for Jeff's di directorship. Great success for him, for Berman, for Hopkins, and, of, and for all of us living during these very complex times. The Berman Institute has had an amazing journey, and under the leadership of Jeff, will continue to add tremendous value to the biomedical field, and who knows, maybe even play a far more expansive role that reaches to many different fields and realms of society. So welcome, Jeff. I'm honored to have my name next to yours. Now I would like to ask Ruth to come to the podium, fellow Cowboys fan, the person who, who has actually made all this possible and the person without whom we would not be here celebrating today. So, uh, 
You, you missed Andreas's sidebar to me, which was go Cowboys. Uh, and for Tom and Andreas and me, this is a little bit more like a religion than uh, anything else. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, Provost, uh, Provost Kumar and Alex Levy have already described something of the breadth and significance of Andreas's extraordinary contributions to Johns Hopkins as a visionary institutional advisor and philanthropist. So I'm now going to heap it on, Andreas, and you're going to have to deal with it. One of Andreas's great gifts is that he never lets what is constrain his thinking about what could or should be. His ambition for the Berman Institute emboldened my own, pushing us forward in ways that I am quite sure would not have happened but for Andreas. And along the way, Andreas gave me a gift of incalculable value, and that is the gift of a very special friendship that I will treasure always. We are here this afternoon to celebrate one instance, one incredibly important example of Andreas's intersected vision and philanthropy. As one of the Berman Institute's wisest and most devoted supporters, Andreas understood that new ventures, no matter how excellent or rife with opportunities, cannot be sustained without strong leadership over time. Andreas also understood that while nothing can guarantee continuity of strong leadership, without a solid financial foundation, this critical feature of successful enterprises is perpetually at risk. In endowing the directorship of the Berman Institute, Andreas made the most strategic gift imaginable toward safeguarding the future of the Berman Institute. We are eternally grateful for his foresight, his commitment, and his generosity. Andreas Tricopoulos is one of the most treasured people in my life, as is Alex Levy, Bud Meyerhoff, Tony and Lynn, so many people that Tom and I have gotten to know only because of the Berman Institute. As the new Tricopoulos director has already experienced, getting to spend time with these people is one of the great perks of this position. I now have the distinct pleasure of saying a few words about that new director, another treasured person in my life, with whom I also share a deep and special friendship, Jeff Kahn. Most of the people in this room know Jeff, and you know what a fantastic person he is. And if you know Jeff, you know that no one loves his family more or has a more loving family than Jeff. I want to take a moment to acknowledge Jeff's dear ones who are with us today, his amazing wife and my wonderful friend, Orly Khan. Over there. Okay. Right. Jeff and Orly's extraordinary sons, Ben and Danny, over there. And Jeff's parents, Gail and Saul Jacobs, over there. And Jeff's in-laws, Josephine and Asher Engler, over there. It's impossible to say who is luckier. Jeff, to have all of you in his life, or you to have Jeff in his. As the rigorous search process that brought us Jeff Kahn attests, and Alex has very fully described how rigorous it was, there is no one, no one better suited, no one better qualified anywhere in the world to be the next Tricopolis director than Jeff. Simply put, Jeff is the leader for the Berman Institute. He brings to this position a wealth of singular leadership experience, experience that bears specifically on what it takes to be a successful head of the Berman Institute. Let me explain. Only seven years after receiving his PhD in philosophy, mind you, seven years in philosophy, right? Jeff became the director of the Center for Bioethics at the University of Minnesota. That's seven years after you get your PhD. 
a position he held for 15 years. Okay? And during those 15 years, Jeff was probably the best thing that ever happened or ever will happen to that center at the University of Minnesota. And he is still sorely missed. During his tenure in Minnesota, his leadership was not restricted to that university. Jeff served on the board of directors of both the American Association of Bioethics and Humanities and the board of directors of the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. And these are two very important national groups in our field. But then Jeff did something else. He decided we needed another important leadership group, another leader important national group in the field. So Jeff played a formative role in the creation of a third important national group. Jeff was the founding president of the Association of Bioethics Program Directors, which is the only national organization for exchange of information and ideas by those in bioethics who have leadership positions. He is so critical to that group that when he no longer held a role that would permit him to attend meetings, the organization had to create a title for him. So they made him emeritus director so they could never be without his regular guidance. <coughs> That's how much Jeff is respected and valued by his peers in bioethics. And it is not just in bioethics that Jeff is valued for his wisdom and leadership ability. Many talented academics in biomedicine and public health, not to mention bioethics, go their entire careers without ever ser serving on a single committee of the National Academy of Medicine. This is commonplace, and it, it does say, not say anything negative about someone's uh, talent or contribution or significance. But Jeff, by contrast, Jeff has already served on six such committees, three of which he, is, he was asked to chair, so six prestigious and important National Academy of Medicine committees, three of which he was asked to chair, all of which he brought to great successful conclusion. His leadership skills are so valued by the National Academy of Medicine that he currently serves as the chair of its Board of Health Sciences Policy, one of the Academy's major governing bodies. It's pretty much hard to imagine a set of experiences that would, be, that would better prepare someone to be head of the Berman Institute, or where you could have better evidence of leadership ability. It just doesn't get any better than this, except that it does. <laughs> it actually does. To Jeff's extraordinary history of leadership experiences and his sterling professional reputation, must be added Jeff's deep knowledge of and love for Johns Hopkins and the Berman Institute. He is, after all, a Hopkins alum, an MPH from the Bloomberg <laughs> School, and he served five years as the Institute's Deputy Director for Policy and Administration and as the Levy Professor of Bioethics and Public Policy, a position he still holds. And finally, finally, there is what no set of titles can vouchsafe and no set of experiences can guarantee, but that I so deeply know to be true. Jeff is passionate about our field and passionate about its potential to make the world a better place. As he pursues his vision and hopes for the future, he will hold us, the Berman Institute a community, to the highest of intellectual and educational standards. And he will do so as the person Jeff is, as a person of great integrity, honesty, good judgment, and fairness, I cannot overstate how lucky we are to have him at the helm of the Berman Institute. It is with great pleasure that I call to the podium the second Andreas C. Dorkopoulos Director of the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics Dr. Jeffrey Kahn.
feel much better being installed than uninstalled, I guess. So that's the first thing to say. Although I'm not sure I feel better about um, succeeding Ruth after all of that. It's um, kind of an overwhelming day after 10 months, but um, here we are. And I want to first say thank you, Ruth, for that um, truly over, overly flattering introduction. Thank you to Provost Kumar for your welcome and your kind and witty words, as, as always. And thank you, Alex, for your always insightful remarks. And thank you, of course, to Andreas for your vision in making an investment in us at the Berman Institute. What you saw when you first came to be introduced to bioethics here at Johns Hopkins, what my predecessor and the Institute's founder, Ruth Faden, envisioned that it could be, and what I hope we can continue to build together. So thank you for your willingness to support us. And by together, I mean not only Andreas, though of course, I hope that it includes you as we progress on this path, but everyone in this room, as well as some who are not able to be here today, <clears throat> the Berman Institute is not so much a thing or even a place, although we could not be what we are without our wonderful and unique in the field home in Deering Hall. But the Berman Institute is a community, a community of scholars taking on the big and important issues of our time in healthcare, in public health, and in science. But its success depends on the reputation for excellence that it has developed, a function of our faculty colleagues and who truly are the best in our field. We all stand on the shoulders of those who come for us, and of course that's clearly true in, in the case of my following Ruth. But the Institute has many others to thank, and you've heard some of their names already, but let me do my part. You heard uh, Morris Offit's name in passing, who was the first chair of the Berman Institute's board and a champion for the creation of what became the Berman Institute of Bioethics. Bud Meyerhoff, who you also heard mention, the second and long-serving chair of the Institute's board, who worked to shepherd the Institute in partnership with Ruth through the critical early decisions and growth of the Institute into what is now recognized as a jewel within Hopkins and its one university approach, and to become what is truly a leading, if not the leading, bioethics program in the world, not to mention the many other contributions that you, Bud, and your family have made to Hopkins, to Baltimore, in Washington, and including your important leadership in the establishing the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Thank you for all of that. Lynn and Tony Deering, <clears throat> where, there you are, longtime supporters of the Berman Institute and so many other things at Johns Hopkins and in Baltimore, and for whom the Berman Institute's singular home, Deering Hall, is named and I mean a truly singular home. There is no other bioethics program in the country or the world that matches the beautiful building we call home, and it really is a unique gift that you made to us to allow us to do our work, so thank you for it. Alex Levy and Vicki and your family, for whom programs, postdoctoral fellowships, and an endowed professorship, which I'm thrilled to have associated with my name, in the Institute are all named. Your support, your leadership, and your vision for the importance of investing in people has been an integral part of the success of bioethics here at Hopkins. And of course, we owe you a huge debt of gratitude for your leadership. And Andreas is the most recent in that long and truly impressive list. You're, as you've already heard from, from others, and I will only just pile on here to say, your philanthropy and generosity are truly inspiring. And I can only hope that I'll be worthy of the honor of carrying your name as now part of my professional title. So I, I, I hope I can do that. Each of you in the room are true partners with the Berman Institute. And your vision of that partnership and the future of the Institute was informed by my predecessor and the inaugural Dracopolis director, my friend, where did she go, <laughs> mentor and colleague, Ruth Faden. You can tell her that I said this. <laughs> <coughs> I was going to say, I'd like to take a moment. Oh, here she comes. Almost came back. I can see her at the, at the glass door. I was going to say, let's take a moment to recognize you. You can clap now as she comes back in. There. <laughs> I, I, I was just saying thank you for being my friend, my mentor, and the inaugural director. 
So what comes next? More than ever, our work in bioethics is critical for clarifying the hard questions, working to blunt the hardships, minimize the challenges, set a path forward, or at least shine a bit of light to show the way on the challenges faced by our society. You already heard Alex talking about the, the challenges that we face at this seemingly critical moment in our country's history. <coughs> Orly and I were just in Prague, um, amazingly, it seems like a long time ago, just last week. And while there, we visited Terezin, the um, site of what is, uh, was the Theresienstadt concentration camp, which is 45 minutes outside of Prague. It's now a museum and a memorial. <clears throat> As our guide reminded us frequently, Theresienstadt was a so-called showcase camp intended to deceive the outside world about what was actually happening in the concentration camps. It was a carefully orchestrated example of fake news, particularly chilling given attempts to manipulate the media and information in both our own recent election and the just completed French presidential campaign, all of which is a compelling reminder of why we need to stand for and practice fact-based and clear-eyed analysis, and as important, the need to point out when that is not happening. I'm confident we can do that. We have the best colleagues in the world, truly so. Talented people who are at the peak of their careers. And I want to say just a few words to you all in the room today. Being in your company is truly humbling for me. And being chosen to um, help lead you is truly the honor of my professional life. As the Dracopolis director of the Berman Institute, I will in encourage you to continue to take on hard questions, and I will support your doing so both when it's popular, but more importantly, when it is not. And I will work tirelessly, and I hope I've shown that I'm already willing to do that, to continue to foster an environment to help you succeed. The questions we have long considered the work of bioethics are inc increasingly intertwined with concerns about the environment natural and built, climate, food, engineering, the very structures of our societies. To make the point, even relatively recent biomedical concepts like precision medicine, in which genetic and genomic information from individuals is used to inform more personalized approaches to their health care, cannot fulfill its promise without consideration of a much wider expanse of things, like an individual's behavior, their nutrition, their levels of activity, their microbiome, the environment in which they live and work, and even as some recent studies have shown, their consumption of media and screen habits. The concepts and approaches we have relied on in what we have called bioethics traditionally are as salient today as they ever were, but our scope is necessarily broader. As areas that formerly did not bear obvious relationships to bioethics, data science, artificial intelligence, for example, are now becoming core tools in biomedicine, in healthcare, and in public health. And so they require our attention both as 21st century versions of what we might have called traditional bioethics topics, but also as opportunities to apply methods and approaches from bioethics to what seem like new areas ripe for ethical analysis. This will be among the critical elements of the work in which the BI the Berman Institute faculty engages and by which the Institute continues to lead the evolution of the field we call bioethics. Now more than ever, our work needs to be accessible to groups that include but extend beyond our academic peers, to policymakers, to professionals, to those leading non-governmental organizations and those building and shaping businesses, and of course to the public. This does not mean that we should water down what we do or somehow share a lesser version of how we describe and talk about what we do. Rather, it means that clear thinking is more important than ever, at a time when telling real from fake is ever more difficult but ever more important. And we have the purchase and the responsibility to challenge fuzzy thinking and unsupported claims about the issues on which we work. Our efforts in communicating what we do to the many publics that matter will be more important than ever as we strive to analyze and address the ethical issues arriving in healthcare and biomedicine, core to the continued flourishing of societies, ours and others. As I stand here today, I'm mindful of the observation that what you do is not who you are. I try to remind myself of that. It doesn't always feel that way. If you're lucky in your professional life, however, 
who you are and what you do come together. Thank you, Ruth, for saying such nice things, actually, that reminds me of this. Being named the Dracopolis director is the dream version of that relationship for me, where I get to wake up every day and think about what is the right thing to do and how we might achieve it. What could be more fulfilling than leading a world-leading institute full of talented colleagues with an opportunity to have a real effect on the world? Last year, you heard about the, this grueling process through which I went. I'm, I'm breaking out in a cold sweat actually thinking about it again. <laughs> Last year, when I was a candidate for the directorship and the process was moving to identify a group of finalists, I had a phone interview with the principal from the executive search firm who was leading the search process. She asked me questions about my background, where I grew up, what sort of childhood I'd had, and so forth. It was really an odd thing, I thought. I was surprised but I appreciated that it was a way to glean insights about a candidate that wouldn't appear on their CV, on their resume. As I described my early life, she remarked how su surprised she was, and she had me pegged as a product of an East Coast private education. I'm not that. <laughs> I didn't know how to take it, actually. I thought that was either a compliment or a really a kind of diss. I didn't know which. <laughs> the truth is, I am a public school kid, from the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, raised by a single mother. I'm a product of that environment, and I'm proud to say that it has shaped who I am and how I see the world. Life can be challenging, and often through no fault of the people experiencing those challenges. In my life, I have always craved fairness, and one can attribute that to lots of things, no doubt partly a product of my experiences. And it came out for me in wanting to be sure that things like the cake was equally shared in its pieces as a child. <laughs> but also in the deep sense of offense I felt as a teen seeing social injustice perpetrated and perpetuated in our own society and elsewhere in the world. My sense was always there, but for the luck of the draw might go any of us. I didn't have many opportunities to act on those fledgling commitments and didn't really have a sense of how I might even pursue an education or a profession that would permit me to do so. And I certainly did not dare to dream, really didn't even know what such a dream would look like or be, of one day leading the best bioethics program in the world. But sometimes dreams come true, and that's the case for me today, truly so. At some point, though, you figure out dreams aren't realized alone, very far from it. And I have had more uh, support than anyone could ask along the way, so I need to do a little bit of that now, recognizing um, a number of people in the room, so please bear with me. And, and this will be in the order of their coming into, into um, my life and me into theirs. So first, uh, my mother. Um, there's much to say to you, starting with a simple thanks for bringing me into the world and for being an example to me of hard work <clears throat> dedication to your family above all else, for giving of yourself to others, and for living a clear-eyed and principled life. Happy Mother's Day, first of all. <laughs> Saul, thank you for your unstinting support. You are, without question, the best thing that ever happened to my mother. And uh, you are a wonderful Zadie to our children. I should say, too, <clears throat> this will be a little hard for me, sorry, even harder than the first part. Um, my mother's young, younger sister was named Janet Friedman. She's the mother of my cousin Dan, who's here somewhere. And the wife, late wife, of my uncle Ed Friedman, who's also here. Dan's here with his wife Lori, and Ed with his wife Eileen. Aunt Jan and Uncle Ed were the first people I had ever known who went to graduate school and spending summers with them and their young family in remote coastal Washington state were truly singularly, singularly important in my teen years, both because they were so different than the rest of my life at the time and for the world they opened for me. That there was a path for people to immerse themselves in trying to answer questions about how human societies of hundreds of years ago came to be and how they carried out their daily lives. I count those summers among the pivotal experiences of my early life. Tom Beecham and Ruth Faden come next, maybe surprising to some. It turns out that I've known Tom Beecham and Ruth Faden. Tom introduced me 
to Ruth, longer than anyone in the room today besides those related to me by blood. Tom, as I've said more than once in other contexts, I was fortunate enough when I came to Georgetown to be assigned as your graduate assistant. It was a, a truly lucky assignment for me. I got to learn at the knee of a master, the true master, a true scholar's scholar. And I'm honored to call Tom my friend and my mentor and my role model as an academic, truly. Ruth, as for many others in the room, has a similar outsized place in my life. And you've already heard that um, we have a long time relationship and she's a dear friend. You encouraged me to come to Hopkins to study public health. I'm sure you remember that when I was doing a dissertation in philosophy at Georgetown and later convinced me it would be a good idea to somehow commute between Washington and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs> every week, believe it or not, to help lead the staff of the Advisory Committee on Radiation Experiments. It will only be one year, you said. Actually turned into 18 months and I, I don't know, nearly killed me and, um, and orally in the process. And then later, of course, recruiting me to come back to Hopkins to assume the Levy Chair, all while remaining a dear friend, colleague, and advisor roles I will continue to expect of you now that I'm director. I guess I can demand that of you now that I'm director. <laughs> <clears throat> you both, Tom and Ruth, along with my mother and my Aunt Jan, were strong advocates for what I take to be the most important decision in my life, which was to propose to Orly Angler to be my wife. She comes next. So somehow, over 30 years, and nearly 29 of those years married to me, you have been willing to walk the path of this life with me. I know that sometimes it has been easier than others, hopefully more easier than not, but you've always done so with an unfailing grace and enthusiasm and support. You always thought there was a future in bioethics, or at least you said you did, and that was most important. <laughs> And you more times than I care to count put your professional goals second to mine. I don't think I've ever known anyone as willing as you to live by the phrase you've always kept close at hand, including on the counter in our bathroom and in your thoughts, which goes like this, wherever you go, go with all your heart. I love you for that, among many other things. You are indeed my backbone. She reminded me of that yesterday, so I had to include it. <laughs> Asher and Josephine, my in-laws, or at least parents. Thank you for being open-minded to a future son-in-law, now not future, but current son-in-law, <laughs> studying something called bioethics, even if you did remind me frequently and as recently as last night that I had hands like a surgeon. Not sure how. <clears throat> yeah, it's realized coming from an engineer, I don't even know how that matters, but okay. So thank you for putting up with me and for your love and support over the decades and the distance. Our children, Ben and Danny. I'm sure any of you with children will agree that our, our children teach us many lessons and offer us many reminders. For me, that has included the motivation to be the best role model and father I can, <clears throat> to act in ways that are consistent with my words, and I, and I have to um, acknowledge that you were both extremely good about being picked up and moved from Minneapolis to Baltimore, and Danny in particular, who did that between ninth and 10th grades. Watching you both grow into a fine young man, a fine young men is a greater reward than any I could hope for. And you make me proud every day to be your father. All anyone can hope as a parent is for sometimes your children will be, will be as proud of you as you are of them. And I hope today is one of those days for you. Let me wrap up. Sometimes people listen to what you have to say because they have to, thinking about children when I say that. <laughs> and sometimes people listen to you because they expect that you have something to say. Some of you have heard me tell the story about the dose of humility meted out to me by Ben when he was about eight years old. He accompanied me to a talk in Colorado one winter 
He sat quietly in the back of the room while I gave my talk, 45 minutes of slides, 15 minutes of Q&A. I came to collect him at the end, and he said, Dad, can I ask you a question? Said, of course. I thought he had listened carefully to the talk. He said, why would anybody listen to you? <laughs> It's a true story. Uh, but he had a point. <laughs> but I, now I'm going to turn it around on all of us. Why would and should anyone listen to us? It's a question that we ought to continue to ask, especially when asked to lead. The title and the position and the reputation of the place aren't a sufficient answer to that question. What is it that we have to say that's important enough that people should listen? Our ongoing task will be to answer that question, and I dearly look forward to our continuing to answer it together. Thank you all for coming today. standing up kind of thing. So please, please sit. And I, I'm only standing here because I have one more bit of business to do. Um, not to accept your applause, which I'm happy to have. but. That wasn't the reason. I, I have one more bit of good, um, good business to share, which is that we are just after uh, an important cele celebration uh, on the part of one of the important leaders in the Berman Institute's life, and that is Bud Meyerhoff, who just celebrated his 90th birthday. We have a cake that will be uh, ready to be shared out in the reception area, but at this point I want to ask you all to join me in saying happy birthday to Bud, and maybe we can even sing. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. Parties in the lobby. So thank you for thank you for joining us. <laughs>